The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Are you a songwriter? Are you looking to turn your songwriting passion into a full-time gig? Whether you are just at the start of your songwriting journey or a seasoned industry professional, this show is made for you. Welcome to The Songwriter Show, bringing together songwriting news, interviews, and community. Now, welcome your host, Sorrento. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I welcome you back to The Songwriter Show. I'm your host, Sorantos. I'm a solo music artist who's been writing lyrics for as long as I can remember. Words are very important to me, and that's why I'm so thrilled to host this show. I believe that every single song is a story. The Songwriter Show is broadcast live on number one ranked W4CY Radio, with listeners in all 206 countries in the world and every state in the United States. The station is also licensed with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and SoundExchange, and has many partnerships throughout the music industry, including iHeartRadio, with exposure to over 300 million listeners. Tonight's first guest is Kirk. Kirk is from Four Stroke Baron. They're a refreshing mashup of new wave and heavy progressive elements with an avant-garde flair. Metal Sucks calls Planet Silver Screen, Catchy as Hell, Larger Than Life, Prog fused agro alternative rock. They're going to release their uh, label debut, Planet Silver Screen, in November. Kirk, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Good. So, did you guys just release your uh, your debut album? Yeah, it just came out on November 9th. Wonderful. And uh, how's that going for you so far? Uh, so far, it's going well. Uh, it's our last album. Or- EP and their first full length album we just released ourselves uh, for free on Bandcamp. And then okay. uh, this is the first time we've actually put ourselves on iTunes and Spotify and kind of uh, purposely tried to market ourselves. So uh, doing that with this so far has made the uh, like the reception to it. Just that there's a lot. <laughs> there's just more. And it's it's all been positive. So yeah, I couldn't be happier about it. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I totally get it, man. What? Uh, who would you say is like the main songwriter? Is it you? Is it a combination? Uh, I'm the main songwriter. It's a. Uh, it usually starts out as it's mostly Matt and I. That's I met him uh, several years ago. We started jamming in a kind of our method of songwriting is usually I'll bring like the skeleton of a song in with uh, some riffs and a. Uh, just a basic idea of kind of where I'm thinking of the structure and uh, the vocal melodies and everything. And then uh, we kind of do a rough version and then Matt, uh, he'll also give a lot of his input on structures and everything. And, uh, and then later on, he'll kind of add his drum parts and then make them more intricate. Sure. And, uh, uh, Ke- Keegan actually contributes, but we haven't, he's only been in the band for, uh, he didn't write King Radio with us. He was actually joined. He joined right after King Radio, our first cool. length in 2015. And uh, he, on Planet Silver Screen, he had a lot of input. Uh, but it's more like I'll have the skeleton of a song. I kind of show it to Keegan and Matt, and we all kind of give our own input on it. And uh, so we all kind of act like it's producers, but it's more like I'm bringing the ideas, and then all three of us are refining it. Okay. Do you when you come up with it is your main instrument guitar? Uh, do you do guitar yeah. chords, vocal melody at the same time? Do you do one before the it's other? A, What's your process? It starts with the guitar and then a just a riff that catches my ear, and then the vocal melodies always come last. Very okay. rarely there'll be a time where I write a riff and then I immediately get a vocal melody with it. Uh, like actually, for example, the chorus in Planet Silver Screen that one was a a guitar riff and a vocal that was written at the same time. I was just kind of jamming out some, uh, some chords and that kind of vocal melody just immediately popped in with it. 
but it's 90% of the time it just starts with uh, strictly the guitar. Sometimes keyboard. Like I'll be playing on the piano a little bit. I'm not great at the piano, but I have like a... I'll, I'll dibble, only like dabble on it, and then uh, also play around with some synths. So sometimes an idea starts with those. Okay, do you need the drum when you start putting together the vocal melody, or do you just use a click track, or what's what's your preference? No, it's it's a uh, it'll normally just be click track, like or actually often we'll write the vocal melodies after the drums are totally done. Okay. So uh, a lot of times we just do strictly an instrumental and i'll always have a vague idea of a kind of what i want the vocal melody to be but i more approach it from let's make an interesting instrumental first and then it's easier to add vocals to an interesting instrumental that also makes the kind of keeps you from like pigeonholing yourself into just doing like a, a okay now we'll just fill in something for a verse and do a boring verse riff and then add some Sure. You find something. It's it. It kind of forces you to make an entirely interesting instrumental song, and then the vocals. I mean, the word afterthought has some negative connotations, but the vocals, in a way, are kind of an afterthought. If that makes sense. Yeah, I get it. I, I yeah. feel like the yeah, like the vocals plug in the last thing because they're just the easiest to fit into anything. Yeah, and how do you That's decide awesome. if a song is going to make it to your CD? Anyone you bounce uh, it off it, of, or just the band, or it's a uh, it's like immediately if I have a riff, I generally know off the bat if it's good or not. Like I'll just be jamming around, I can kind of tell when I have a riff that just isn't great. In a so normally I'm like really confident in the riffs that we have. Like we'll we'll have I'll usually write two or three riffs at a time in a for one song, and it's it's kind of on a song by song. We do it like one song at a time. Like I'll, I'll start with just a cycle of two riffs and then uh, we'll just kind of refine those and then uh, kind of start it that way. And it's, so it's more song by song. It's, okay. uh, like we don't, we don't have a lot of songs that we record and then decide aren't going to be on the album because it's, it's a, uh, we do like a rough demo version that we just keep recording and kind of refining. Sure. In a, so like, the song will start out as kind of a weird, almost cut and paste skeleton of what we think it could be just so we can sort of listen to it and be like, Oh, let's, let's see if this kind of structure, these riffs will flow together. So it'll kind of start with a really lame demo that, uh, at least gives us a sense of where the riffs are going or where the music's going. And that helps us kind of, before we actually commit to recording a song, we, we know we're going to have something good and we don't have to, record it and then find out after we spent all this time recording that it's not going to turn out good. Yeah. Nothing more frustrating than that. Right. Yeah. Cause we, that's, we've done that. I mean, with the, there's, a, there's this one song. It's fun with this album. I don't think we have any, there's one part that we never added in. It was this, uh, acoustic part in a, like if you listen to the album, there's no acoustic guitars on the whole thing. So it obviously kind of stuck out as a sore thumb because the album has all these, I mean, to me, it sounds kind of modern, has all these synths and kind of a, like a spacey modern vibe. So uh, yeah. the, acu- the acoustics on it, any, any with acoustic guitars kind of sounded weird. So we, we did that, but that was a really easy thing to record. Uh, but there was a couple songs, I think two songs for King Radio that uh, we spent a lot of time several hours recording it and uh refining it getting it perfect but then you start putting tracks together at the very end when everything's done in a you just you're trying to fit it in somewhere and it kind of hits you like damn the song's good on its own but it's not contributing to an album at all and it's a so it's a careful careful process at the end making sure that uh you don't throw something in just because you've put a lot of work into it like there's a huge sunken cost fallacy when you're recording music that you want to just, uh, if you've spent a bunch of time on something, even if it's not the best, you really want to keep it, put it on the album because you put all that work in, yeah. but you have to be able to kind of look at yourself honestly and be like, okay, this maybe isn't making the album better. So, uh, it, it happens, but it's, it's for the most part, we, uh, 
we know what we're going to record before we actually record it. So it's a, it's not too bad. Yeah. And I think what you just touched on Kirk is key. You know, I think when you first start, you want to keep everything. And like you said, things you spend a lot of time on, but I think as you become, as the years go by and you become more of a professional, um, I'm kind of ruthless with my editing now, whereas five years ago I was very meticulous. And um, now I try to just, if it just doesn't sound good and I'm trying to force it, I just cut it. And I think that's important to to be able to do that. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It's a, how is, it's, how is uh, yeah. you guys have a band, so how is it balancing all your obligations, personal, work-related? How do you guys uh, fit together with that? Um, It's a... Uh, I think the one good thing that we have, I feel like uh, all of us kind of have like a really like take charge kind of aggressive personality. So we, I feel like our all of our entire lives are just aggressively trying to get this music just to to fit and work in. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, but with like with working, Matt and I we started jamming seven years ago. We didn't start recording until 2014. Before that, we just, uh, I'd go over to his house every, like, once a month or so. And we would just jam, have fun. Uh, uh, but we didn't really take it serious. And uh, so we didn't we didn't really put a lot of time in until King Radio. We did the EP. The EP was just kind of, uh, we threw it together, which I think actually makes it sound kind of cool. It sounds thrown together in a cool way. Like it's, uh, we just didn't care about anything. We didn't overthink anything. We just kind of, whatever felt right, we just did it. And, uh, you can hear that on the EP and then King radio after the EP caught on, we, uh, decided to kind of put more effort and time into King radio. So King radio at that time, we were, Matt and I were both going to college and, uh, and what would I wait? I had graduated. He was going to college and, uh, so I was working full time and, uh, he was going to school. And just in between class and working, he would just come over in the evenings to my house and we would just uh, work on it. And then uh, with this one, it was like, I have a weird schedule. Uh, Like when we were doing Planet Silver Screen, uh, it was mostly, it was kind of just like my schedule was kind of broken up. So there'd be some days where I'd have off and I would just spend all day working on it. And, uh, we hold it up in the house where Matt and Keegan live. We set up a, a studio in this big room and, uh, I would just spend my days down there. And then days where I worked, I would just spend my evenings like editing it, working on it at home on my computer. And, uh, so it's kind of a, it's more just, we find a way. <laughs> sure. Our main, it's not, do what not you gotta do. We just, uh, we just do it compulsively. Yeah, you do what you gotta do. What's the uh, funniest thing that's happened to you guys recently? Oh man, the funniest thing. Uh, that <laughs> I think the the weirdest thing that happened was uh, when we went on our last little tour in uh, California. We went, played our first show in L.A. and we, it was at the Viper Room, which is that uh, like popular venue. Uh, River Phoenix overdosed at it. Yeah. Johnny Depp owned it for a while. Uh, but now it's kind of, it's a junky little bar in a, right on the strip. And we get there really early, like a few hours early. So we get there at like 4 PM and uh, we hear something going on inside. All this music's booming. So we knock on the door and this guy opens up. He's like, Oh, Hey, what's, what's up? Like we tell him, uh, Hey, we're playing here tonight. We're in a band. Uh, we're seeing where we should put our gear in. If we could drop it off here, uh, what time you want us to load in all this stuff. And, uh, he just kind of looked around he's like, well, uh, technically you guys are supposed to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but, uh, we're filming a music video in here. How about you guys just come in if you want to be in this music video? And we're like, okay, whatever. So we just walk in, and it turns out Wiz Khalifa was filming a music video in there. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so there's like this huge crowd of people, and uh, they gave us these little instructions for us to just stand in the crowd 
and we had to dance and just pretend we're really into this uh, new Wiz Khalifa track. That's awesome, and, uh, man. Did you get a chance to meet yeah, him or no? No, he was. We saw him, and we we tried to get a picture with him, but uh, I think that was part of the non disclosure agreement. Is what I assume. Yeah. I, I don't think you were able to talk to him. I think they specifically wanted everyone to put phones away and kind of ignore Wiz Khalifa. Sure. He had, he'd, he'd do a shot, like he'd run up on stage, he'd sing the song, and then he'd immediately jump off stage and kind of go to the side where no one could see, get to him. And, yeah. uh, he was kind of closed off. And then we, we kept trying to meet him, but uh, he just kept kind of taking off and going away. So, uh, uh, and we, we were hoping to get in like a really clear shot of all of this in the video, but, uh, the video just came out and we looked at it and you can, for a split second, you can see Matt's arm and all the <laughs> tattoos, his dream theater tattoos. It's so dark in there. You, unless you're really looking for it, you can't really tell who it is. Yeah. That's really cool. Tell us where uh, listeners can find information about your songs, your band, and where can they buy your music? Uh, so the bl- best place to buy it uh, is probably just the prosthetic store on Prosthetic's website. Uh, they have vinyl, CDs, everything. We also sell T-shirts and uh, vinyls and CDs on our website, just fourstrokebaron.com, and that has uh, the bio, all that stuff. It's kind of more like a electronic press kit that's online. It has all of our information, but I think the best best way to find us is just Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. And just kind of listen to our music. I mean, that's, I think, our most interesting thing. Okay. Do you guys have a website? Uh, yeah, fourstrokebaron.com. Okay. And tell us a little bit about the song we're going to hear. What's the title? And tell us what the motivation is behind it. Uh, the song is called Planet Silver Screen. It's the title track of the album. And, uh, it's actually kind of a funny story. Like a lot of times when we write lyrics, uh, it was when we started, Matt and I would just kind of sit around and, uh, we'd wonder ourselves like, dude, we have to, we have to write lyrics now. What do we write about? And we ended up the best way for us to write lyrics is just come up with stories. So, uh, a lot of our songs are just based on either random stories we think of. And this particular one was based off, just this insane dream I had where uh, aliens were abducting humans because they loved humans, Hollywood movies. So aliens <laughs> were abducting humans and then taking them back to their home planet and then forcing them to act in a, these just super messed up, brutal uh, Hollywood movies and uh, just basically enslaved all these humans in a, I had this dream and it was actually when around we were recording and I told Matt, I was like, dude, this could be a wonderful story just for getting some lyrics for the song. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. All right. Before we listen to your song, what's your band's uh, go-to comfort food? If you're in the back room, no. what do you guys got to have there? Oh man, fried chicken. We always get raisin canes. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> kind of a weird thing we have. Okay, that's interesting. All right, man. How about your go-to? What's your go-to drink? Uh, go-to drink. Oh man. Uh, I think if if we're drinking alcohol together, it's always Coors Light. Okay. If I'm drinking just anything myself, I'm kind of lame. It's usually Powerade. <laughs> Powerade. All right. <laughs> Coors Light or Powerade. We're clearly a classy individual. Yeah. All right, Kirk. That's awesome, man. All right. We're going to hear uh, Planet Silver Screen. And Kirk, it was a pleasure having you on. I appreciate it. All right. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, man. Have a great night. Here we go.
And now, welcome this week's special guest. Welcome back to the Songwriter Show. Our next guest is Richard Lynch. You would be hard-pressed to find a musician as authentic as Richard. His traditional country music fully embodies his hay-raising, farm-dwelling lifestyle. An all-American, blue-collar country man, Lynch has poured his heart and soul into his numerous chart-topping hits. For three decades and counting, Lynch has written and performed his songs with passion and dedication. Welcome to the show, Richard. Well, thank you for having me. I sure appreciate that. Uh, You're very welcome. You have a very fascinating story. So tell me a little bit about uh, who's your role model? Well, I grew up in a country music household, uh, and my dad was uh, definitely me, definitely my inspiration. He, uh, I grew up every morning, and he'd be singing and listening to that good old country music. So definitely he would be my first and foremost uh, role model. But uh, as far as... Uh, as far as my heroes are out there, I grew up listening to people like uh, Conway Twitty and Merle Haggard and George Jones and all those traditional artists that, uh, you know, still bestowed their music to this day. I just love that traditional sound. Sure. You can't go wrong with that. So tell me a little bit about what's your fondest musical memory as a kid growing up? Well, I would definitely say my fondest memory was the first time I got to go see my dad perform. He was uh, doing a show. Uh, this would have been, I was eight years old at the time. And uh, he was doing a show with a guy by the name of Porter Wagner. And uh, Porter had a bunch of uh, country songs. And he was on the sh- TV every Saturday night. So the first time I ever got to see my dad perform, um, he was performing with Porter Wagner. And uh, my dad was on the show, of course. And me and my, my mother and um, my brother was all out, out in the front row watching the show and uh unbeknownst to me he's, he had sang four or five songs and he uh pointed down to my mom and said hey send richard up here to the stage with me and so i i got up and did an old song uh, by buck owens and uh the old song was called i got a tiger by the tail and uh <laughs> and wow. we uh, got up and did that song and uh and uh and it's my earliest memory so that was uh that was pretty phenomenal to to think back on that yeah, that really is, man. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. What's your primary instrument, Richard? I play acoustic guitar. I, I can play I can play a few other instruments, but, but mainly I just play acoustic guitar. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your songwriting process. You do lyrics first, music first. I come up with a, a hook. Um, and by that, I mean, if there's somebody that says something clever or for some reason or other, I hear a line that really stands out to me. Um, I jump up and write it down at that particular mo- moment because, um, you know, I get really busy on the farm and everything else that we're doing. If I don't stop right then and write down that idea, it don't don't uh, last for long. It goes away pretty quick. So, you know, I just uh, I find that uh, particular so- uh, line that I enjoy and uh, I'm just stop and write it. OK. Tell me the craziest thing that's ever happened to you on the farm. <laughs> oh, God. Well, um, I don't know how familiar you are with traditional country music, but we had a um, a Grand Ole Opry star here at our farm. Is coming last summer here, this previous summer, and um, her name was uh, Jeannie Seeley, and uh, she was out walking around the farm. And um, before we have a show here at our barn at the farm, and she was walking around the, sh- the barn, just just enjoying everything, and uh, and she walked up to the fence where we have some livestock and. Uh, Unbeknownst to any of us, the, the little miniature donkey decided to reach out and grab a hold of Jeannie Seeley's green pantsuit and take a big uh, bite out of the the pantsuit. So we were <laughs> we were pretty uh, we were pretty uh, uh, devastated at first, but she really took it with a you know a good sport, and we all laughed about it. But that was pretty amazing. We were, <laughs> we couldn't believe what we were seeing, so it turned out to be pretty funny. Yeah, that is. How do you balance things between the farm and songwriting and performing? What uh, what's the biggest challenge? Well, you know the the farming takes a lot of effort, and uh, I have to be able to, you know, have folks uh, step up and, um, you know, if we're gone on the road for two weeks or four weeks or whatever, I got to make sure all the animals are taken care of, and we're pretty fortunate to have some some um, employees and neighbors that help us out immensely there. Um, but it, it's really challenging to be gone for two or three, four weeks and knowing there's a bunch of responsibility back at home tends to, 
tends to make you worry. But for the most part, we make things work pretty well. We have a bunch of good friends and, and folks that help us out a, a lot there. Okay. Do you try to write every day, once a week, once a month? What's What do you try to do? Um, if you say a clever line, I'm going to start writing, writing in a few minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, it's it's interesting you say that because I, I have an iPhone probably like most people. And maybe about three years ago, I used to write on paper and I digitized my songs. And, you know, I kept hearing, especially in Nashville, they're like, oh, you got to have an idea book and you got to. I have a note that just keeps getting filled up with ideas, just like you're talking about whenever I watch something, hear something. And I think all songwriters probably do that nowadays. But uh, it's, it's a great uh, it's a great invention, man. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly writing little ideas down. If you're if you were sitting at my kitchen table right now, you would see two stacks of notebooks with all kinds of little ideas and <laughs> parts of ideas and little snippets of this and little snippets of that. But, you know, it's great to have that because, you know, ultimately, if you're in the process of writing a song and you're, you know, you I'm always want to be clever. I like to I don't like to write like anybody else. I like to have my own little approach on things. And so. You know, you can look back through your notes and see a line that really um, didn't fit for the last two or three songs, but all of a sudden, wow, it really goes great here. And so it's great to have that little, uh, you know, that little backlog of ideas. Yeah. It also helps prevent writer's block. If you got this, all these ideas out there, you're going to get inspired from reading something. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. You know, just being around the, the, the industry, the music is inspiring a lot, a lot because, you know, we are on the road a lot and we we travel. i got a guitar player, uh, Tim Bennington, that uh, has been with me for about three years now. Me and him have been, uh, have been co-writing together and uh, I'll, I'll bump some ideas off of him and him, me. And, that, uh, you know, it's been pretty it's been pretty good. I've been doing a lot of writing here lately. That's that's so wonderful to have someone to bounce things off of. And some of the people I interview are bands like Kirk was. Some are like soul artists like me who have nobody to bounce anything off of. And it really is fascinating to get another person's viewpoint because you could think something is great. And then they're like, like you said, trying to get clever. And they're like, no, no, that's just stupid. That doesn't make any sense. So it's it's wonderful that you have that. It really is. And, you know, I, I learned something a long time ago, uh, especially for trish, traditional country music. You know, um, a wise person told me, Richard, just just keep your message simple. Keep your your melody lines simple. Keep your um, your music to where it's simple. And yet it's, you know, people will hum along and, and follow your chorus line and your song line and be able to relate with you. If you make music too complicated, you tend to lose people. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. And that's great advice. I know in my five years of doing this, that's probably the best advice I ever received. And uh, it really needs to be simple. It's not like classical opera with complex everything. And I think you, you hit that head on. I agree a hundred percent. You know, if you, um, if you if you sing over your audience's head, you're really not c- connecting with them. And for tr- traditional country music, you know, uh, everything I write about is from the heart. I mean, I lived it, or I seen it, or you know, we felt it. Um, you know, there's some kind of an actual um, an, an actual event that took place, or I've heard something that I that I heard someone say. But it, the music ultimately came from the heart. And if it comes from the heart, then also ulti- you should be able to connect with somebody else because you know, I, I've heard songs before and I thought, wow, they could have wrote that song for me. And uh, I, I took some advice and said, hey, just keep it simple and write to the write to the lyrics that, that people can connect with. And it seems to be working. Yeah. And on that point, don't you think you have an advantage as a songwriter that you're not taking someone else's music and lyrics and trying to fit it into you? You're writing it yourself. Exactly. You know, there yeah. was. There's already George George Jones and George Strait and Merle and all those guys, you know, and 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 you know I love their music, but you know um, if you uh, go through life doing everybody else's stuff, you know you you really haven't accomplished much as far as you know creating your own identity, and uh, the the music creates an identity for you, and um, you know you can be um, accepted in the industry with a with you know, your own music a whole lot better than trying to come across as somebody else. That's true. And you know how it is being in the business. 
you know, all these people, some of them claim they've written their own stuff and they haven't. They just buy it. So it's there's this irony sometimes when you hear these performers talk about stuff and you know they haven't written their stuff. So it's it's always exactly. fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And, any hidden hobbies that you have that uh, you want to confess on the show? <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife keeps me pretty busy. I can tell you that. She would, y'all see the list. <laughs> y'all see the long list of the honeydews that she keeps me doing. No, I'm kidding. She's great. My wife's my best friend, and we travel all over the world together. Um, um, you know, when I'm not farming, and uh, you know, I, I've been I've been a builder a long time. I've I built this big, beautiful barn on my farm, and uh, out of necessity, I grew up helping my dad on the farm, and so I learned how to build and and uh, do all the great the, the great way of country life, you know, all the chores around the farm, and so anything to do with the farm, I love. And uh, so you asked about the uh, a hobby. I got a pretty pretty fascinating hobby I like to do every now and then. Um, I like to go metal detecting uh, around these old homesteads and dig up old coins and stuff. It's pretty pretty fascinating. Well, that's cool. Yeah. You're going to be like one of these guys on the beach combing through looking for a hidden treasure? Well, I've never done that before, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it's fascinating that some guys do it. Yeah. You know, it really, you know, we we're in a, in southwestern Ohio, just about 30 miles north of Cincinnati. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of old homesteads, old farms and so forth around here. And it's amazing um, all the old uh, treasures that are laying around these old houses. And uh, I didn't realize, really, really realize it until recently. Well, the last few years or no, or how how much stuff it is out there you can dig up and have fun. And it, ironically enough, my lead guitar player, he loves doing that thing too. So we have a lot of fun whenever we want to get out and just have a, an hour or two to kill. We hit hit an old homestead and start digging. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's definitely unique. So what about the uh, United States is a very big you know, country and you've been you've toured a bunch. If you mm-hmm. could get rid of one state, which one would it be and why? <laughs> Whoa, that could be I could get in trouble on that one, so I'll try to back her off a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um I, I think I think a lot of folks have um have uh drifted in a certain direction. I, I I'm pretty easy to get along with. I, I I'm realizing that the older I get, um and the fact that mainstream country radio has uh, has really left out traditional sound so you know I, I haven't been anywhere yet that i have not been accepted or even actually i've been people have really relished the fact that we've been there so having not been to california i can't pick on california yet but that's probably the one we would probably pick on <laughs> you know it's gonna it's the closest one to falling into the ocean right with an earthquake or something so <laughs> You know, I've I've played in almost. Uh, I think I probably played in thirty or thirty five different states. I've worked in Ireland, um, where our music's being played all over the world. And um, you know, I'm so fortunate that that's just finally happening to me. So uh, I'm I'm going to gracefully re- re- reject the idea of uh, <laughs> bad mouth in a state because I think there's right. some good fans out there. <laughs> all right, I got gotcha. you. Um, how would you describe the smell of a really hot barn? to someone a hot barn yeah well if if you've ever drove down a country lane and you've heard or you smelled any um hay being fresh cut um you know you're going to smell um you know the aroma of clover or you're going to uh, in our barn anyhow you're going to smell um you know alfalfa curing out uh, we have sweet feed to keep there in the, in the barn for the horses, and so that's got a sweet, sweet smell. Generally, okay. it's a, generally it's a pretty sweet little little smell in the barn. But you know, every now and then, when we clean the stall, if you tend to lose that sweet aroma. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, where can our fans find out information about you, or can they buy your music? Well, uh, the best way to, to find out anything about us is to go to richardlynchband.com. And, uh, you know, you can see our music being being played on all the all the uh, current uh, social media websites and everything that's out there. But Richard Lynch Band is probably the best way to find anything about us, our tour dates, our schedules, our merchandise. And, uh, and we're doing a really big uh, event here in um, February. And we're doing out of... Um, 
out of New Orleans, we're doing a country music cruise this year. So we're doing a Texas tour. A lot of great things are happening to us this, these days. Uh, super cool. So what's your next trip? Well, we're, we're off until New Year's Eve. We just did a gig um, in Louisville, Kentucky previous week, and we've been in Michigan. We've been in um, Missouri. We've been Alabama, Texas, been everywhere. So we got, we got three weeks off with the holidays, and we play New Year's Eve in the Cincinnati area. And then we go to a uh, – we do a three-week tour in South Texas, and then we come up out of South Texas and do a week tour out of um, – uh, New Orleans and with the uh, the country music crews and uh, and then we're going to be we're going to be back home for a few weeks and playing regionally and then we're going to do a Florida tour and we're going back to Texas again so we got a lot of a lot of traveling to do. Okay, before we let you go, Richard, tell us the title of this song and tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind it. Well. We were doing a, a radio tour uh, two summers ago, and uh, we were traveling through uh, Texas, or excuse me, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky, doing a uh, a country music tour to promote a, a different song called "We're American Proud," and uh, this, that song was doing really well. And I knew we had a California uh, interview coming on, and uh, I was on the interstate, and I typically like to pull off the interstate and and talk when I'm doing a, when I'm driving, but we didn't have time. So the phone rang and the gentleman was telling me, wow, Richard, I love your music. And, you know, we, we follow you. We see how busy you are. And, uh, he said something to the extent of the Lord must be traveling with you because you're everywhere. And I said, I like to think he is. And without any further ado, the next thing he said to me, do you mind if we pray on the radio? Now, I had never been asked that before, and I never have since. And uh, like I said, me and my wife, were, we were traveling doing the radio show, and never before would there be a pad of paper in the seat, but there was a pad of paper between us there. And never would you, without a search warrant, have a pen or pencil to find But there was a pen right there in the dash. And so I'm driving down the interstate. I got the phone to my left ear. I'm trying to drive, and I'm writing down the lyrics as to what he is saying. So every lyric in this particular song is exactly the conversation with me and the disc jockey, um, who, uh, who, uh, who, amazingly enough, I do not know his name. So I would love to be able to find out who that disc jockey was because he inspired the song as we were doing the radio to inter- uh, interview. That's very cool. So uh, I'll wait next year to hear the song from this interview that that I inspired you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Richard. I'm going to be writing here almost immediately. I want to say yeah. a very special thank you, my friend. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for being on the show, and we're going to hear your song right now. Thank you, sir. All right, Richard. Thank you. been writing my songs and telling my stories I finally got my songs played on the radio I've been doing interviews around the country and then one day A DJ asked me Can I pray with you? He said Do you mind If we pray on the radio Do you mind We talk about the Lord I truly believe God's watching over you You know there's no better company than Jesus While you're out on the road I told the DJ right then I'd be more than happy Share my thoughts and inspirations about my songs. 
I'm thankful God likes my music Enough to ride with me So if you're hearing my country music Then know that Jesus tags along Do you mind If we pray on the radio Do you mind If we talk about the Lord I truly believe That God's watching over you You know there's no better company than Jesus While you're out on the road I know there's no better company than Jesus While we're out on the road Another wonderful show. I want to thank our guests, Kirk and Richard, for being on the show tonight. It was another great songwriter show, and I want to thank the fans for tuning in every week. And I want to thank the guests. The month is December, and that means Christmas is right around the corner. So I thought I'd leave you tonight with a song I wrote several years ago called The Happiest Time of the Year. I've always loved Christmas as a child, and to me, that's exactly what it epitomizes. I hope you have a wonderful night, and I'll see you again next week on Tuesday on The Songwriter Show. They say it's the most wonderful time of the year. I say it's surely a time filled with cheer. Some people say it's usually a silent night I say Christmas always makes me feel so right It's Christmas time again An easy time to enjoy a friend It's a time that's so special to us with time honored traditions we simply trust. It's truly the happiest time of the year, so special and so full of cheer. Time to be with my friends, time to say sorry and make amends. Will you be happy with me? It's a very simple time you must see. Let us remember who we truly are mere mortals with a gentle heart. Some people go Others love to play in the snow Sliding around for all to see Some kids even throw snowballs at Frosty It's just the time I'm eager to treasure All kids I hope have no displeasure a simple happy time of the year For Santa to give them some cheer It's truly the happiest time of the year So special and so full of cheer Time to be with my friends Time to say sorry and make amends Will you be happy with me? Let's a very simple time you must see Let us remember who we truly are Mere mortals with a gentle heart I want to build a snowman I want to buy some presents I wait up for never Santa Could hear the angels.
angels sing They sing for little Jesus our King And all the three wise men did appear Yet little baby Jesus Mary still held dear And Jesus was finally here and all was right Christmas was born on that cold, fateful night A tradition was begun, we've come to love That moment God set motion from up above It's truly the happiest time of the year So special and so full of cheer Time to be with my friends Time to say sorry and make amends Will you be happy with me? It's a very simple time you must see Let us remember who we truly are Mere mortals with a gentle heart song, cause no one else has, for so very long. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to The Songwriter Show. To keep the momentum going, head over to www.songwritershow.com and join our free music community of artists, songwriters, and producers. That's www.songwritershow.com. 